Disciplines of the Christian Faith. We are going to start today with an introduction to the Christian spiritual disciplines. All of today, I'm going to be talking about a little bit about the history, but more than anything else, what are we talking about when we talk about the spiritual disciplines of the Christian faith? Why are they needed? Why are they important? I'm also going to talk about some of the dangers that may be associated with the, spiritual, the traditional spiritual disciplines and why some people have such heartburn about it. If you go online and you do a, a search for Christian spiritual disciplines, you'll get some of the most vitriolic polemics against what I'm going to tell you today that you can imagine. Some people just don't get it. Today I'm going to tell you why I think this stuff not only is right, but is critically important for our Christian growth. So we'll be discussing that as we go along. Next week, we are going to look at the first two of the spiritual disciplines. I've structured this class, that, and we'll talk about you know, a massive list of uh, things that you could consider spiritual disciplines. But through this class, we're going to be dealing with two spiritual disciplines a week. Next week, the second week, we will look at Bible study and meditation. In Whitney's book, he calls it Bible intake. Because it's more than just reading it, it's more even than just studying it. It's allowing it to soak into your life. And so we will talk about that next week. Bible study and meditation. On the third week, we will talk about prayer and journaling. The fourth week, we will look at fasting. Okay, now you've done it, Ross. <laughs> you love preaching and gun to meddling or, you know, whatever. Fasting and simplicity. There's another one. And I'm, I'm going to be speaking on sim simplicity just in time for you all to bring things in for the bazaar. <laughs> i got a lot of work to do myself in that regard. <laughs> on the fifth week, we will talk about worship and confession. The sixth week will be service and stewardship. And if you don't know what all these things mean, you will by the time we get through those classes. Week seven, silence and solitude. <laughs> And then week eight, we will do a conclusion, practicing the uh, Christian disciplines, and then a final exam. Let me talk about the final exam and the reading for a second. I, I should have done this um, in terms of business. The reading schedule that is on this sheet, you'll notice that there's two, two columns, one for each book. There is not a lot of reading. You can tell, unlike the, some of the other books we have, these are not big books. There's not a lot of pages for you to read each week. But it's well worth reading and taking your time with it and letting it soak in. So don't, don't be shocked by that. Some of the people that are in the New Testament survey and New Testament theology class looked at all the reading we're asking of them. Well, holy moly, this is like a graduate level course. Well, it is a graduate level course, as I told them. If you're not taking it for credit, then do the best you can. Don't beat yourself up. Don't feel like something's wrong if you can't get it all read before the class starts. In fact, the reading schedule actually has some readings that were for today, but not a lot. You can catch up on those if you didn't get the books earlier, if you haven't read them yet. But when you read this material, it's really worth letting it sink in, because this is good, solid stuff that I think is critically important for you. Um, so, let's talk about what you should expect from this class, from the spiritual disciplines of the Christian faith. By the end of this class, and I didn't add here, like as I did in the other two classes, assuming you attend the lectures and read the materials. <laughs> By the end of the class, you should understand what the historic spiritual disciplines of Christianity are, what basis we have for them from Scripture. Our Christian conduct, including the spiritual disciplines, is based upon Scripture. How and why they have been practiced throughout the life of the church and how to begin to practice them for your own spiritual growth. That's the goal of this class. You'll know what the spiritual disciplines are, you'll know where we get them, what we base them on, and you'll begin to have an understanding as to how you can practice these disciplines so that you can grow in your Christian faith. Okay, any questions about that? Are we good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what are the spiritual disciplines? You may not have any exposure to this because we all are Protestants. Protestants have not, have not talked that much about these things, and I'm going to get into that in a second. The spiritual disciplines, this is one definition. I could give you several, but I, I like this definition. Actually, this is partly somebody else's and partly mine. The spiritual disciplines are practices that we willingly pursue in response to a God who created us, who saved us, and who guides us. Spiritual disciplines draw us closer to God, deepen our understanding of who He is, and help us become the men and women that He desires for us to become. 
That's what the spiritual disciplines are. They are practices, and you can, you know, you can tell from the, the list of the class each week, and the classes each week, we're talking about Bible study and prayer and journaling, some of the things that you may very well be doing already. But we're also talking about fasting and silence and solitude and some of the things you may not be doing yet. We could add to that list, and we will talk later about some of the other things that could be included on that, but uh, that we might practice, or there are some things that are listed as spiritual disciplines that we wouldn't practice, because we don't believe that they are consistent with Scripture. Some of the practices that are used in, in disciplines of the Catholic Church, for instance, um, just outside San Miguel de Allende, there's a village that is known because of the cathedral there. That's the center for a, a movement within the Mexican Catholic Church that advocates flagellation. You know what flagellation means? Beating yourself as an act of penance. Penance. We don't believe that. We don't believe that's consistent with Scripture. If I feel like I have to need, I need to beat my body in order to be okay, then that means I don't believe that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ was sufficient that I have to suffer somehow because the suffering of Jesus was not enough. We don't believe that. That's not scriptural. So there are some practices of spiritual discipline which we don't accept, that we don't believe in, and I'm going to be particular about that as we go along. Okay? So, let's get into this a little bit. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it here for a minute. Okay, because I want to get started and give you some content. Um, I may or may not have two hours worth of uh, content today. I put together what I think you need to hear. If we don't end up, when have I ever not had more to say, right? <laughs> but if we, if we get out early, then you can go home and pray about it. Okay. <laughs> I need to say that in the past 30 years, there has been a resurgence in the interest in and practice of the classical disciplines of the spiritual life, which are these. Okay. Um, I say 30 years or so because this book was written in 1978. I've heard Richard Foster speak twice, and both times he has said when he prepared to write this book, uh, and there's sort of in the introduction materials in here, he talks about how he sort of came to do this and the encouragement he received from people. When he came to write this book, he started by looking for other materials that had been written about the classical spiritual disciplines of the church. He couldn't find anything, nothing that had been written for the previous three decades before he wrote this book. Particularly in Protestant circles, there had been a complete vacuum of interest or focus or discussion about these things. When he wrote this book in 1978, he really did kick off kind of a revolution where we rediscovered it. Another thing he said, he's, a, he's a, 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 I think, a very humble man from everything I can tell. He said it embarrasses him because people will come up to him and talk to him as though he invented this stuff. That he came up with the spiritual disciplines that he talks about in the Celebration of Discipline. And he always goes, hey, it's not me. People started doing this 2,000 years ago. The Church of Jesus Christ has been practicing these disciplines for 2,000 years, except for the last, now it's been, you know, 60 years ago we stopped. We are beginning to rediscover that. The work of Richard Foster, uh, Whitney is another one, um, another man named Dallas Willard. Dallas Willard is a fascinating guy. He's a professor of philosophy at USC, but, but a very popular Christian writer. He is a, an evangelical Christian. Um, he wrote the, uh, the book called uh, The Divine Conspiracy, which Christianity Today named the number one Christian book in 1999. He also wrote a book called The Spirit of the Disciplines, which is about exactly this stuff, and I'm going to quote him a little bit. We also have some other people that wrote during this time period, uh, Henri Nallen, who was a, a French priest, who, um, a fascinating guy, his... his Lean is a little bit, bit more toward the mystical, and we'll talk about what that means in, in, uh, throughout the day. But Nowen was a professor at Harvard. He was a, a significant man of God, a Catholic man of God. But he, um, at a certain point in his life, he felt God was really laying it on his heart that he needed to commit his life to service. He could have, Nowen at that point could have gone anywhere in the world. And, and been invited to speak anywhere he wanted to speak. He could have made all the money he wanted as, for, you know, speaker's fees or writing, because his books are hugely popular. There's a lonely now in society. Instead, he chose to go to Canada and to live uh, in a, 
a center for people with severe disabilities. When I say live there, he lived in a room with two people who were incapable of taking care of themselves. They were so severely disabled. He fed them, he washed them, he clothed them. He was one of the most famous Christian writers and speakers, a former professor at Harvard. He spent the last number of years of his life caring for people who had very severe needs as an act of service to God. That gains a lot of credibility for me. Okay. Um, now, when died a number of years ago, I may talk about some of his stuff as we go along. As I say, as a Catholic, um, a Catholic who follows the spiritual disciplines, he leaned a little bit more toward the mystic than probably we would. But um, I believe he was a great man of God. I look forward to meeting him someday. Um, now, these writers, Richard Foster, Dallas Willard, O'Reilly Allen, and um, Whitney, and others, there have been others, you can get other books in this vein now, they're, they have been united in their view, starting with Foster, that the spiritual disciplines that have been historically practiced by the Christian church, they were developed really in the early centuries of the Christian church. They, they go back, as I'm going to talk about in a minute, to Jesus and how Jesus lived his life. But these spiritual disciplines, we have rediscovered the fact that they're not just good. In many ways, they are crucial for us really to pursue a holiness, uh, a relationship with God, of the kind we should have. And these writers have argued that the classical um, disciplines of the Christian faith, which include things like intaking the Word of God and making it part of our lives, of prayer, of fasting, of silence and solitude, that these things are essential practices for the people who love Jesus if we really want to become more like Him. And that doesn't mean, I'm going to say in a minute, it doesn't mean these things save us, it doesn't mean these things are, are make the difference in us being saved or not saved, but it's the difference in whether we're just muddling along in our faith or whether we learn what it means to have a victorious Christian life. You know, Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Now, when he said abundantly, he didn't just mean when he comes back and we are all with him in heaven. He means now. Okay? He means how, and, and the question we have, in fact, I think I've got it here, uh, how do we live the abundant life Jesus promised? How does one live the spirit-filled life that was promised by Jesus in the New Testament? And not just muddle along. See, part of the problem has been that in our Western Christian mindset, you know, North American primarily, which is where most of us come from, our Christian culture has focused on propositional truth, meaning it's a, a mental... <coughs> assent to what we believe are stated truths. And in doing so, we have tended to remove anything that wasn't cognitive, that wasn't propositional. Do you understand what I mean by those words? We take statements of truth and say, yes, I believe that. I believe Jesus was the incarnate Son of God. We have lost what it means to, to have that change our lives in very real ways. <coughs> yes, we believe those things are true, and by believing in Jesus Christ and professing, that Jesus is Lord, I am saved. But is my life really made different after that? Or is it all from the neck up? Most of our Christian experience in the West has been from the neck up. It has not been here. It has not really changed our lives. And I'll go so far as to say, we read the scripture about not just Jesus, but the apostles and others uh, performing miracles. In Bible study, people are always saying to me, why don't we see those kinds of miracles today? I think it's because we have lost what it means to have the Spirit truly fill our lives in the way Jesus told us we should. We are not like Jesus. We are not like the early disciples. We have lost what it means to have our whole beings change. Not just that we get saved and then struggle on. Our whole beings changed, transformed by our relationship with Jesus Christ. Our relationship with God the Father in and through Jesus Christ. Okay? That's what the spiritual disciplines were all about. It was about transformation. So that we don't just say, we don't just believe in Jesus and we're saved, and then from then on we're just spectators. <coughs> we're sort of watching the traffic go by until we die or the Lord comes back. Let's face it, that's how most Christians in the West live. We're talking about something different from that. Where we're not just spectators, where we are transformed. And there has been a historic approach to the spiritual disciplines that have transformed people's lives. Okay. 
But without a personal commitment to that kind of change, unless we really believe that it can be an abundant life, that it's more than just a cognitive, a pro, a, a cognitive acceptance of propositional truths, until and unless we do that, we are always in danger of being dominated and manipulated by a culture that doesn't get that and doesn't go for that and takes us in entirely the wrong direction. How many Christians do you know, maybe even you, I don't know, that despite the fact that they profess and really have a belief in Jesus Christ as the saving Lord, their primary activities in life are worrying about their money, you know, worrying about the kids, trying to make sure their house looks good, playing bridge three times a week, trying to get their golf score down by two points. There's nothing necessarily wrong with any of those things. But the problem is for many of us who are Christians, that's the thing that takes us from day to day. That's the thing that wakes us up in the morning. That's the whole sum total of what our lives is about, even though we profess, and it's true, that we believe in Jesus and we will be saved. We've got to have more than that if we are really to be like Jesus, which is what Scripture says we're supposed to be. So, I think we need to recognize right up front, go back to, to this slide. Uh, well, I'll use this one. This is a quote from Evelyn uh, Underhill. She said, we mostly spend our lives conjugating three verbs. <laughs> to want, to have, and to do. Craving, clutching, and fussing, we are kept in perpetual unrest. I think that's absolutely true, and that's true for Christians too in our culture. We're talking about breaking that cycle to become more godly. Whitney, in his book, he says the whole point, everything we're talking about here is the pursuit of godliness to become more like Jesus which really is the main reason we are still here. To grow in godliness, to grow in relationship with God the Father through a growing relationship that the Spirit gives us with Jesus Christ. That's why when we got saved, God didn't just vacuum suck us up into heaven. We are here to serve others and to become more like Jesus in the process of growing closer to Him, to be more perfect. Jesus said, be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. I believe that's a process. We won't ultimately be perfect, but we should be better. Are we getting better? For the most part, we aren't. And let me say too, I'm, I'm up here teaching and preaching. Um, at various times in my Christian life, especially in seminary days, I was much more involved, actively involved in, in pursuing spirituality. Spiritual formation is the term they use in terms of this uh, pursuit. Um, <coughs> And yet, I haven't. That hasn't always been my focus. I get so busy with preparing for classes and for sermons and everything else that I have not pursued this in the way that I should. And so, one of the reasons I'm teaching this class is because I believe it's so important that I really need it. And so, we are going to be growing together in this over the next eight weeks. We are going to be learning together. We are going to be experiencing together. And by God's good grace, hopefully, we will all become more like Jesus and grow in this. So. I confess to you right up front, I have not arrived in this stuff. I feel as though there are aspects of it in terms of uh, studying of Scripture and to a great extent in prayer that I, I feel good about where I am, but I'm, not, I'm nowhere near as close to being like Jesus as I should be and need to be and want to be. Okay. Now, we need to start out by saying the very word discipline is a problem for many of us. <laughs> Discipline to some of us reeks of negative connotations. It suggests some sort of tyranny, eternal, external restraint, or legalism or bondage. For many of us, it means a diet. Okay, You have to be disciplined to not eat the things you want to eat. And so for many of us, that idea of discipline in spiritual disciplines is by itself a hurdle that we have to overcome. But if we look at Scripture, I think that we can see that in fact... The definition of discipline that's in Webster's, the first definition, is accurate to what Scripture describes. That definition is, discipline is training that is expected to produce a specific character or pattern of behavior. Discipline is training that is expected to produce a specific character or pattern of behavior. And in fact, we don't have to think about it just a minute to realize that nothing of any significance in our lives or anybody else's life Ha happens without some degree of discipline. 
you got to focus. you got to apply yourself. If you don't, things don't happen. Okay? What's the definition of slacker? Somebody who just sort of floats along and does not discipline themselves to accomplish things. We need to recognize that Scripture gives us many examples of how we are called upon to be disciplined. For instance, the book of Proverbs. Okay, what's the theme of the book of Proverbs? What's Proverbs about? Wisdom. Wisdom. And this whole book of the Bible is about how we can acquire wisdom. How? By being disciplined. It is a book, the book of Proverbs, and that's just one of the books, talks about the pursuit of wisdom, of discernment, of understanding, of gaining knowledge of God, of living a better life through discipline. Much of Scripture could be defined as giving us instruction on how we need to be disciplined in order to be more what God wants us to be, and you know what? Whether we're conscious of it or not, to become more what we want us to be. Who doesn't want to be better? And especially, who doesn't want to be better in our relationship with the Lord? So, the how many of you play musical instruments? Years ago. Years ago, okay. <laughs> Did you start playing a musical instrument well by waking up one morning and saying, I think I'm going to play the piano? <laughs> Did you? No. How long does it take to develop, to really be accomplished with a musical instrument? Years. Years. Years of what? Practice. practice. And what is practice? Yes. <laughs> you know, practice, practice. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice. Okay. That's just one example. If you want the piano to make beautiful music, you have to have some discipline. Or pay somebody else to do it. But that doesn't get you the satisfaction of that. Okay? That's just an example. Nothing of any significant worth happens in our lives without some application of discipline. And the mistake that people make is thinking that it, inherent in the idea of discipline is some sort of bondage. That, oh, i got to brag it. Well, okay, there is a point at which you say, I have to not do what I want to do in order to be able to achieve something. But once you have disciplined yourself to that point, if, and then you, you've studied for years and you've, you've practiced for years and you sit down at the piano and you've learned to, you're good enough that you can improvise, is there any greater sense of freedom than that? The idea is that discipline is not an issue of bondage. Discipline is the thing that takes us to, to a point of freedom, of being free to express. Discipline is a road to freedom. And I'm, I'm going to give you a quote here, which I think is really good, and this is the one, Pat. <laughs> the job of a football coach is to make men do what they don't want to do in order to achieve what they always wanted to be. <laughs> Who is that? Oh, no. Who is that, Pat? Huh? Yes. The best football coach oh, no. Dallas. that Dallas ever had. Okay. I thought you were going to say that God ever created. That <laughs> so, too. Yeah, it's true. In other words, the job of a football coach, and we in our own lives, we have control of our own lives, the issue is, are we prepared to be disciplined? Which means, do some things that we don't necessarily want to do or are inclined to do. I'd rather go put my feet up and watch TV. But you know... If I want to become what I really want to be, to achieve what I really desire to achieve, in this case, uh, a fellowship and unity with God, I need to be disciplined about it. That's the spiritual disciplines are the tracks by which we pursue that. Okay. Now, in the New Testament, we need to recognize that Jesus Christ modeled all of this for us. Jesus engaged in classic disciplines, which included solitude. Remember, he went off to be by himself. Silence, which is one of the reasons he went off to be by himself. Uh, simplicity. Do you remember that the, the birds have nests and the, fox, you know, the foxes have dens, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head? Mm -hmm. Jesus renounced many of the things of the world for his ministry. Um, study. Prayer. Sacrificial service. And fasting. It's interesting, we talk about fasting, people go, whoa, now you're getting crazy. Okay? <laughs> Jesus said, when you fast, do it like this. He didn't say if you fast. He said when you fast. There actually is an assumption, we'll talk about that in more detail when we get to that part of that class. 
There is an assumption on the part of Jesus that we will pray. He said, when you pray, pray like this, our Father who art in heaven. There, in the time of Jesus, in his life and the life of the apostles and the disciples that came right after them, there was an assumption of many of these spiritual disciplines being practiced. Jesus himself practiced them. And therefore, and, and why did he do it? I mean, Jesus did not practice these spiritual disciplines because he somehow was lacking in something. All right? He was the Son of God incarnate in perfect fellowship with the Father, knowing the mind of God, the Father, and yet he practiced these disciplines as a way for him to maintain a closeness of relationship and as a way for him to be obedient to the Father in heaven. If Jesus practiced these things, solitude, silence, simplicity, study, prayer, sacrificial service, fasting, and the rest, don't you think it might be a good idea for us to do it? Because I think we probably need it more than he did. <laughs> I think our goal is to be like Christ. And it is a completely wrong-headed illusion for us to think that we can be like Christ without imitating his spirituality. The kind of practices that he himself followed in his relationship with God the Father. We need to be more like Jesus, especially in how he practiced his spirituality. Are you guys getting this? Is anybody really having a heartburn over this so far? No. Okay. Um, you're just waiting for me to say something new agey, aren't you? <laughs> well, that's not going to happen. It's popular today, and I actually kind of like the idea. You've seen the, the wristbands that say WWJD. Uh -huh. You know what that means? What, 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 would Jesus what would Jesus do? Well, asking, and I like that. I really do. To find ourselves in circumstances where we say, what would Jesus do in this situation? But the problem is, if we ask ourselves, what would Jesus do, and yet we have done nothing to prepare ourselves spiritually along the model of what Jesus gave us, would be like saying, okay, I'm going to go out at 3 o'clock and run a marathon without, never, without ever training for it. <laughs> we cannot expect to either perceive things or respond to things in the way that Jesus would have unless we prepare ourselves spiritually in the way Jesus did. Well, we can never be equal to him. He is the Son of God. But we can be more like him, and that's why we have these disciplines. Why the church has determined that these disciplines need to be practiced in our spiritual life. Um, another quote here, where is it? Oh, here you go. Dallas Willard, who wrote um, a couple of books I mentioned, and I just downloaded one of his books, I haven't read it. <laughs> Willard said, when it comes to living the Christian life, we sometimes suppose that we are doing well if we attend church and crack open a Bible once or twice a week. If believers expended the same time and energy in cultivating their spiritual lives as they are willing to invest in becoming reasonably skillful at any sport or hobby, the world would look with wonder at the power of the body of Christ. <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> Again, People are always asking me, why do we not see the kind of power and miraculous expression and all the rest today that have been experienced in the New Testament and in many parts of the world during the 2,000 year history of the church? I think this is why. I think that's exactly why. We discipline ourselves in our lives for any wide variety of tasks and functions. We study for academic pursuits we, uh, or professional fields. You know, we take classes in order to perfect our skills in the job, in order to advance. If we're athletically inclined, we're disciplined in order to train for a marathon or learn to, you know, to strengthen our muscles to be able to press 300 pounds. Why then do we not think it's important to discipline ourselves for the primary reason we were created, and that is to have fellowship and relationship with God, to grow in that relationship. If Carolyn and I never talked to each other, if I didn't make a point of finding times that we could spend time together and talk together and share together, how am I going to grow in my relationship with her? It's no posible. Okay? It's not possible. The same thing is true in our relationship with God. Okay. And yet, Western culture has quite consistently, with the exception of some people who understood and got it right, and most recently writers like Richard Foster and Whitney and Dallas Willard and others, we have tended not to make a connection between 
the need for us to be disciplined in spiritual matters and our spiritual growth and maturity in relationship with God. We've disconnected those two and don't realize that there is some that we need to work at it to get closer to, to be more like Jesus, to be closer in our relationship with God the Father. <coughs> so like Tom Landry said, um, discipline means doing things you don't necessarily or immediately enjoy doing so you can rejoice later in the outcome of the task. I'm paraphrasing it. So spiritual disciplines, which are sometimes called the spiritual exercises or the spiritual practices simply, are, again, actions or activities that we undertake for the purpose of cultivating our spiritual develop, development to become more what we and what God wants us to be. Simple as that. Now, I do need to say there are a lot of different kinds of spiritual disciplines around the globe. There are spiritual disciplines in Hindu spirituality, in Islamic spirituality, in Buddhist spirituality, in New Age spirituality, and on and on. Any belief system almost that's existed for more than uh, 30 minutes has developed some sort of approach to, or techniques to try to be more what they think you ought to be. That's not what we're talking about. Our concern is for the specific and distinctive Christian spiritual disciplines all of which are based in the fundamental confessional statement that Jesus is Lord. If you're afraid that the idea of talking about spiritual disciplines is going to take you in a wrong direction, the only thing you need to do is always remember that the bottom line on all of this is our confession that Jesus is Lord. That grounding, that foundation, will lead us as Christians into a greater experience of the Holy Spirit through the spiritual disciplines and a closer relationship then with God the Father. So don't make the mistake. I'm going to talk in a few minutes when I talk about some of the problems that we face here, or some of the dangers even. Um, the idea that people get wrapped up in this just, just doing these things as though doing the discipline is the point and that that's sufficient. It's not. It is relationship with God. To gain in our pursuit of godliness is the point. And that is always anchored in the reality of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Jesus is Lord. Okay? So we must always make sure we are focused squarely on the person of Jesus Christ, not in the way somebody makes him up, because people have all sorts of screwy ideas about Jesus. Our spiritual focus is squarely on the person of Jesus as revealed in the New Testament. It is what we know of Jesus based upon the revelation God has given us in the New Testament of who and what Jesus was in his act for us, okay? So, that's what the spiritual disciplines are. I want to talk a little bit more now about why we need them. I suggested it earlier. Um, Dallas Willard, again, in his writing, he has talked about the fact that the modern culture that we experience has offered us all sorts of roads or routes to fulfillment particularly self-fulfillment. There have been various kinds of uh, political goals, scientific, psychological, emotional, drug-based, better living through chemistry, whatever it is. And yet, for all of those efforts, I mean, just go into, go into any Barnes & Noble the next time you're in the U.S. or Canada and look for the self-help section. God. Yeah. Right? Huge. Um, nice rhythm. Um, and yet, for all of that self-help orientation, for all of the promises that our culture has given us as to how we can be fulfilled in some way, let's face it, our culture is suffering from an epidemic of depression, of suicide, of personal emptiness, of escapism through drugs and alcohol and other addictions, of cultic obsession, consumerism, you know, retail therapy, okay, and sex and violence. They claim that they've got all these possible routes for us to be fulfilled and satisfied and find the things we want. Well, is it working? No. It's not. And particularly as Christians, we need to say the Christian faith offers us a model for transformation that far exceeds any promises that any other kind of approach in our Western culture can offer. But how do we really achieve that. Again, as I said a minute ago, how does one live the spirit-filled life that was promised by Jesus in the New Testament? Yes, we can be saved, 
But if you think that Christians don't experience the same level of depression and loneliness and suicide and escapism and addiction that the rest of the culture has, you're not paying attention. Because we do. Because there is something we haven't sorted out yet that is more than just to be saved by belief in Jesus. And that's what we're talking about. Don't make any mistake. Our faith in Jesus Christ, our declaration that Jesus is Lord, is the thing that saves us and it gives us instant forgiveness. We don't have to work for that. We don't have to pursue disciplines in order to have salvation in the name of Jesus as we accept him. But there's another concept that is in the New Testament, and that is the concept of sanctification. Do you know that concept? It means to become holy. How are we doing on that one? Are we becoming more holy? Can we really see a difference in the lives of the average Christian today versus the average other person in Western culture? I think we're missing it. And why is that? Why is it we haven't figured out how to access the promise Jesus gave us when he said, I came, that you might have life and have it more abundantly. To be more perfect. To be filled with the Holy Spirit in a way that we can manifest that kind of experience before others and that power before others. In fact, our Western culture has gone so far away from that that we have actually changed our language so that we don't even have the words in our common vocabulary anymore to talk about spiritual things. When you start using language about spiritual things, when I said fasting, people, whoa, even if you're joking, nobody thinks about that stuff anymore. It's not part of our vocabulary, of our discussion. You start talking about solitude, and people go, why would you want to do that? Isn't that lonely? <laughs> we no longer have either the concept or even the language to be able to deal with these things in our lives. And yet we need to regain that, to understand how God's Spirit can work in us to be part of our lives, to bring us closer to Him. Now, um, when we talk about the fulfillment that Jesus promised, the abundant life, most of us think that means that, that Jesus has promised us that we will have more joy and that we will have a, a, a specific purpose. And those things are true. And on a good day, we're aware of that and we're pursuing those things. But... Traditionally, in the history of the church, and I believe this is biblical, and I believe absolutely it's true, Jesus meant more than just that. He meant more than just greater joy or greater happiness and more purpose. I believe he means that he wants to radically change the nature of our lives, that we will be fundamentally different as we grow closer to him. Okay? And that salvation in Christ promises a, a life that is characterized by higher ideals and higher levels of experience of God than we currently, most of us, have. And after all, which of us, even within our faith, have not had times in our lives when we feel emptiness, that we feel vacuum? We all feel that sometimes. Which of us has not longed for greater intimacy with God? Which of us has not desired greater understanding of His Word, or more fulfilling prayer life, or any of these kinds of things? Christians... And this is the important point. Christians down through the centuries, starting in the first centuries after the time of Jesus, identified that there were certain practices and activities that kept the spiritual channels between us and the Lord open in a more real way and kept us, our hearts turned more toward God. That's the point. To keep us turned more toward God so that we on a day-to-day -day basis can experience more of Him. Those are the classic spiritual disciplines. Those disciplines cannot save a person. They cannot start up a relationship with God that didn't already exist. They can't by themselves make us holy. Don't misunderstand me on this stuff. I'm not offering you an alternative to a commitment of faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior. That has to be there. But if that is there, the spiritual disciplines can heighten your desire for intimacy with God. They can make you more aware of God's love for you. They can help strip away some of the barriers that are keeping you from intimacy with God and from turning toward Him. They can focus your attention on the love of God in a way that will give you a desire for greater obedience. All of those things have been demonstrated in the church down through the last 2,000 years. These things are not magic, and they're not just acts of willpower. They are rather tools that the Holy Spirit can use to
create in you a desire to surrender and to be remade or recreated toward God. Okay? Um, and I'm going to make one more point, then we're going to break for a few minutes. It's also important we don't make the mistake going into this that the whole point is so I can be cooler. The spiritual disciplines are not just for me to be better. It's not just for me to have personal change. It's not even so that we can be a force for good in society. The point here is that the ultimate goal is for us to become like Christ and to further his kingdom as a way of honoring God and his desire for us. He comes first. Our point isn't just to try to make North America a better place to live in. Okay? Those may be side effects. But the primary thing is to focus on God. And that's what we're talking about in the spiritual disciplines. We're going to take a break for about 10 minutes. I also want to say that there are a number of other resources. Um, when Richard Foster in 1978 wrote The Celebration of Discipline, as I said, there weren't a lot of resources. In fact, almost none. There were some Catholic mystic kind of stuff, which I'll describe in a few minutes, but very little else. Well, that's not true now. 35 years later, there are a lot of resources that are available to assist us both in understanding and in practicing the spiritual disciplines. For example, this is the Renovari Spiritual Formation Bible. Richard Foster, writer of Celebration of Discipline, started a ministry called Renovari, which means to renew, to, to renew one's spirituality. This is the Renovari Spiritual Formation Bible. It is a joint effort of Richard Foster, Dallas Willard, the other guy I've been quoting, Eugene Peterson, the guy who uh, translated the message. You all know the message? Okay, the, the, I, I made the mistake for a long time of calling it a paraphrase. It's not. Uh, Peterson actually translated it from the original languages. But it's a very friendly um, uh, translation so that you can really get into the word. And also Walter Brueggemann, which is a, he's a major New Testament theologian. So um, this particular study Bible, I don't recommend this as your only study Bible because this has got such a specific focus on the spiritual discipline, but it's a useful tool. And if you go online, there's a Renovari <coughs> website. Um, you can look up Richard Foster and find it immediately, or Dallas Willard. This, for instance, has um, 15 progressive essays on living the with God life, which is one of the ways they talk about you know, spiritual formation or the spiritual disciplines, is learning to live with God. You know, in terms of relationship, an ongoing, constant basis. Also, they have spiritual exercises that help incorporate and deepen you when you're encountering uh, your Bible reading. A spiritual disciplines index that provides a glossary and Bible references for each of the spiritual disciplines. Here on the back, you know, it's got um, the all the verses. It's sort of like a concordance, but it's specifically about the spiritual disciplines, like uh, confession and fasting and. Uh, and prayer, and it will take you to, it actually lists all the verses here so that you can read them. So lots of other kinds of resources as you begin in this class. You don't have to go out and buy more fat books, but if you go online, there are, you might want to, it's a good book, but uh, I don't recommend it as your only study Bible, but there's a lot of other materials and resources online that will help you as you begin to learn about this stuff and grow in it, okay? Any questions about what we've done so far before I get into part two here? All right, I want to spend a few minutes talking about what are some of the spiritual disciplines. We've mentioned two or three. Um, where do I want to go here? Okay, I'll stop on that Landry quote for past sake. Um, <laughs> spiritual disciplines frequently are broken up into categories or groupings. The most common way of thinking about the spiritual disciplines tend to be internal, which would be things like prayer, versus external, which would be things like fasting. Um, at times they are also broken up into individual and corporate, because you have things like worship and celebration that are corporate activities. They don't have to be, you can worship on your own, but they're also expressed in a corporate sense. Uh, so individual and corporate is another way to think about these things. Dallas Willard, in his book, uh, The Spirit of the Disciplines, actually talks about the two kinds of disciplines as being the disciplines of abstinence, which would be where you deny yourself something for the sake of trying to grow spiritually. That would include things like, for instance, solitude, silence, and fasting. 
Solitude, you're denying yourself the company of others in order to be alone in the presence of the Lord. Silence, where you try to shut out the noise in the world in order to be able to hear the voice of God more clearly. And, fa and fasting, where you deny yourself something. It doesn't have to be food. You can fast from using your cell phone if addiction to cell phone is something that's, that's tying you to the noise and busyness of the world. You can fast from television. Or you can fast from food. It could be from anything that's not necessarily evil. I'm not suggesting any of those things are bad. But if they're things that are occupying a big chunk of your life, you can fast from them as a way of simply stepping back from the things of the world in order to be more open to the things of God. And again, this is something that for 2,000 years Christians have been discovering that those things are useful and beneficial in terms of your spiritual growth. Jesus did all of those things. He got off by himself. He got into the quiet because it says he went away to a quiet place. Right? He, he fasted and he expected his followers to fast. So all of these are things that in terms of the what Willard calls the disciplines of abstinence, of pulling back from something or denying yourself something in order to be more open to the things of God. The other category that Dallas Willard uses he calls the disciplines of engagement. So the disciplines of abstinence and then the disciplines of engagement. Engagement are those disciplines which, in which you do something which will benefit you spiritually in a positive sense, like study or prayer or confession, where instead of denying yourself something or taking yourself away from something, you actually are adding something. You know, you're adding time to study God's Word or to confess um, and James said, confess your sins to one another. Um, we have problems with that because we tend to think that that's a Catholic thing, that we're looking for priests to forgive us. No, we're not going there. But are we open to someone who is a confidant, maybe a spouse, maybe somebody else, where we reach the point where we recognize that we need to confess in order to be able to, to find a place in our heart where we can receive God's forgiveness for that? God is always available to forgive us. Are we ready to receive it? That's what confession is about. Okay. So, when we talk about the spiritual disciplines, this list will give you sort of an idea, um, and this is an admittedly incomplete list. This is just some of the disciplines. Here we have uh, Bible study, meditation, prayer, fasting, silence, solitude, simplicity, service, fibulant, stewardship, <laughs> Confession, submission, fellowship, you could add to that, and, and we're not going to talk about all these in class, but these are all, I think, legitimate disciplines people have pursued. We could add guidance. It is not just a Catholic thing, the idea of having a spiritual mentor or a spiritual guide, someone who has a level of, of experience or um, spiritual maturity that can assist us. The idea, not that they call the shots. There was a movement a number of years ago called the shepherding movement, which was supposed to be kind of a mentoring approach. The problem was they got to the place where they said the shepherd could dictate to the people under them whether they took a job or not, or whether they moved or not, or you know, all kinds of stuff. They got way out of hand. We're not talking about that. We're talking about somebody who can, in the case of guidance, it's not up there, guidance being someone of greater spiritual maturity who can assist you, who can, who can help you, who can pray with you, who can guide you. Um, Others would include perhaps uh, hospitality, self-control, singing, slowing down in your life, the, uh, study of things other than scripture, the process of teaching. I learn more when I teach than when I study. Um, of worship, of celebration. Now I'm going to talk, some of those things uh, I'm iffy about. And I'm going to talk about why some of those things may or may not be legitimately called spiritual disciplines, even if we do grow in them spiritually. But the foremost of all the spiritual uh, disciplines of the church has always been and should be a focus on the written word of God. That's why Bible study is up there. Study is not even the right word. Bible intake is probably a better way. That's the term that Whitney uses in his book. Because it involves reading the word of God, studying it, memorizing it. Oh, memorizing it. Ooh. Do you know your telephone number? Barely. Barely. <laughs> Barely is good enough. Then you can, you can study and memorize the things of God, the, the, the passages of Scripture. You can do that. You, most people, there's all kinds of things you've memorized. Okay? You know how to find your way home. You can memorize a Scripture verse. 
So memorization and then meditating on scripture. We'll talk about meditating when we get into it. Some people think meditation, ooh, again, new agey kind of stuff. Meditating on scripture simply means to read the word of God and then to spend some time saying, what does God desire for me to learn from this? How does this apply to my life? Speak to me, God, the Holy Spirit, and help me understand the truth that you want me to take out of this. And to spend some time with that. That's what it means to meditate on the, on the Word of God. It's really not that mysterious. But you have to do it in order for it to have any benefit. Without the discipline of God's Word, and by that I mean the written Word. Jesus, of course, was the incarnate Word. But we're talking here about the written Word. Without the discipline of God's written Word in our lives, through reading, studying, memorizing, and meditating on it, then no other spiritual discipline is going to be successful for you. And for the very simple reason that God has chosen for us to reveal himself in the truth of his written word. People say, oh, well, he revealed himself to me in Jesus Christ. That's true. But where did you learn about Jesus? In the scripture, in the Bible. The Bible, the written word, is God's chief revelation for us today. Those who actually lived and walked with Jesus, they had the significant benefit of meeting Jesus and learning from him and being able to say, as, as John said, and we have beheld his glory full of grace and truth. Well, we discover Jesus through the, his presence in the lives of others. I mentioned in Bible study today that I came back to the Lord after being gone for a long time because of two people who I said, I want to be like them. And the part that I wanted to be like was the presence of Jesus in their lives. But still, the testimony of the truth of Jesus Christ is primarily in His Word. Without that revelation that God has given us in His Word, it's very difficult for any other spiritual discipline to help bring us closer to God. Because that's where we find out about Him, and what He's like, and what He desires for us. Okay? So we must focus significantly on the written Word of God, on intake and by reading it, studying it, meditating on it, memorizing it. A couple of verses here. From a, okay, that's not the verse I thought I was going to put up there. This is the verse I thought I was going to put up there. Um, no, what? that's the same thing. <laughs> I have a mistake. Okay, uh, let me read it to you. <laughs> Second Timothy three sixteen and seventeen says, "All Scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking." Correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It is the Bible, the written word of God, which is God breathed, which means that literally the, the, the pneuma, the breath of God, the spirit of God, has given it to us for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And that term training in righteousness could very appropriately be applied to the spiritual disciplines. And so the word of God is foundational to that. Um, and one I think I have up here. Can you tell us what that scripture was again? Yeah, please? okay. Actually, I'm in a different place, I think. Uh, it is Second Timothy. Timothy 3, 16, 17. I think I know what my problem is. There it is. I went the other direction. Second Timothy 3, 16, and 17. It's um, in Joshua also, Joshua is told, keep this book of the law which is the scripture. In that case, it was the Old Testament Hebrew Bible. We have the New Testament now as well, but it is still God's word to us. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. And I'm going to say something really bold here, and some of you are going to disagree with this, and I'm not even 100% sure I believe this yet. <laughs> I do not believe in the prosperity gospel, okay? That you, I think that's a life in the pit of hell, the idea if you give to God, then he has to give back to you. But there are too many verses that say things like, then you will be prosperous and successful, for me not to believe that there is some relationship between us committing ourselves to God. That doesn't mean he's going to make us rich. You can be prosperous and successful and not have a lot of money. But I have known people who went through their lives, and some of them simply for, this isn't for everybody, for some people. So if somebody's had struggles, don't think I'm indicting you for anything. But for some people who go through their life, and everything is a trial. I'm not saying um, that you 
You do all these things and you're gonna, everything's going to be great for you. Because God does send tests. He does send trials in order to mature us, in order to focus us. C.S. Lewis, we talked about this in Bible study. C.S. Lewis said that sometimes pain is the megaphone by which God gets our attention. Okay, So I'm not saying absolutely here, but I think there may be some truth to that. That the, the, when we seek to be more godly, more in relationship with God, I believe he gives us a, at least a balance in terms of our experiences and how we understand those experiences. Okay, Because there are too many verses that say this kind of thing. Do this and you will be prosperous and successful. I am not a prosperity gospel person. I am not saying, you know, love Jesus and you're going to get rich. Absolutely not. I have known holy people of God who love the Lord, who, when I was with World Vision in Africa, you know, a family who loved Jesus so much, they had nothing, literally rags, and a, a cow manure hut. They were given a calf to raise, and they danced in joy before the Lord. Well, did I have that faith? Okay. So I'm not saying prosperity thing, but I think there is perhaps a link between our desire to be committed in faith to God and if not what we experience in life, then how we deal with it in life. Okay? All right. Uh, so the, the first principle is the written word of God and absorbing that into our lives, focusing on it. The second principle, the second discipline, I think, in terms of any kind of hierarchy would be what we have here in terms of prayer. Prayer is our spiritual communion with God through, and there's a lot of ways you can talk about this, I think the most useful and simplest is the ACTS prayer, if you're familiar with that, A-C-T-S, which is adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Supplication means asking for the things you need. I like that for several reasons. One, because it's real easy to remember, and secondly, because it keeps everything in the right priority. You start with adoring God, praising Him for the fact that He is our Creator God who loves us and who has given Himself for us. You start by praising, adoring God. Second, you then confess your own sins. The fact that you are not blessed by God or even loved by God because you deserve it, but because He is a, a blessing and loving God. And you confess your sins to Him and ask for forgiveness. Then you give thanks to Him for His blessing, for His grace, for His mercy, for all that He provides for us. Everything in your life belongs to God, and He has given to you for your blessing. And so we thank Him for that. And then fourth, and last, supplication. We ask Him for the things that we need, not just the things we need. Start with the things that other people need. That's another way to keep balance. Don't always start with you. Start with the needs that other people experience. But then God told us that when we have needs, we should come to Him, come to the throne of grace for those things as well. So, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Prayer is a fundamental discipline, right up next to Bible study or Bible intake, in terms of the needs uh, of what we need in order to grow spiritually. The others, when we start talking about fasting and silence and sol solitude and simplicity and service, and some of the things that we're not as familiar with, then we begin to add those things to them. But we will start with Bible study and meditation, and with prayer. And we mentioned journaling. Um, I should say that um, that will carry us into the next thing I want to talk about, which are what are not some of the spiritual disciplines. Um, it's possible for people to come up with anything and everything that I feel some spiritual benefit from, I'll call a spiritual discipline. One of the popular things that's happened uh, in recent years is for people to call creation care or being concerned about the planet that as we practice concern for the planet, that that's a spiritual discipline. I don't think so. It's a wonderful thing, and I am huge on that topic. I believe that we are called upon to be stewards of the garden. God gave us the planet to be stewards of, and I think we have a huge responsibility. But that doesn't mean it's a spiritual discipline, because a spiritual discipline is an activity that is intended to draw us closer to God in spiritual union with Him, and I don't know that that would. If you, if you carry that kind of thought very far, you could say, you know, well, I go to the nursing home and there's a little old lady there and I give her back rubs and she really benefits from it and I feel good about it. So that's a spiritual discipline. The spiritual discipline of giving back rubs to little old ladies. Right? Where does that stop? We, I think that, that in order for us not to get weird about this or carried away with it, in order for us to have some kind of focus and definition, I would think that spiritual disciplines need to be the things that are mentioned in the New Testament, either directly or indirectly, 
that are specifically identified as things which are supposed to lead us into greater spiritual maturity. Now, when I say directly or indirectly, there's, there, there's a little bit of looseness here or ambiguity. Something like journaling, which you know, we're going to talk about when we talk about Bible study. <coughs> journaling is not listed. You know, we don't know of Jesus ever having written anything specifically except when, when they brought the woman caught in adultery and he leaned down and wrote something on the sand. And um, they all, he said, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. And then he bent down and he was writing on the sand. And they all kind of wander away one at a time because they had to confess they weren't without sin. We don't know what Jesus was writing then. Wouldn't it be cool to know? That's the only time we're aware of, of him writing anything. I'm sure he did because he could write. But journaling does not occur in the New Testament. But if journaling is simply a shorthand way for us to talk about self-examination and contrition and thoughtful Bible reading and honest prayer and all of those things that are part of the spiritual disciplines, then journaling gets a thumbs up as a spiritual discipline because it incorporates all of those things, not because it is its own self. But again, I think that we need to be careful that we don't just start piling up different Christian responsibilities. Uh, there's no logic to that in terms of the many things that we're told that we need to be and do as, you know, as people of faith. Uh, many of those things, for instance, are gifts of the Holy Spirit. We are told that every believer is given at least one gift of the Holy Spirit for the common good, Paul said. <laughs> for the common good. Well, if we, you know, that's given to us for service within the body. If we take every one of those and start piling it up just because we feel blessed when we use them, then the whole idea becomes a little bit um, too nebulous in terms of spiritual disciplines. So, uh, and I read a quote here from Dallas Willard again. For these reasons, it seems the part of wisdom to restrict the label spiritual disciplines to those Bible-prescribed activities that are explicitly said to increase our sanctification, our holiness, our closeness to God, our conformity to Christ Jesus, and our spiritual maturity. So, this list, something perhaps more than that. We believe, we being Protestants, Protestant believers in Jesus, there are some things that have been practiced within the Christian traditions of the past and even today, I suggested this earlier, which we do not believe are spiritual disciplines we should pursue, like flagellation or in any way, in any other kind of self-mortification that you know, to, to harm, to, to cause yourself pain, believing that in some way would make you uh, more holy. I don't, I don't think we would we could speak out in support of going miles and miles and miles on your knees to get to a shrine. Those are not things. Chanting, thinking that the actual act of chanting is going to make us more holy. Or the use of prayer beads. And interestingly enough, the idea of using prayer beads started in India with the Hindus and then was brought to the New World and got adopted by the, in the Crusader time and then got adopted in the Catholic Church. And by the way, I'm not trying to pick on the Catholic Church here. <laughs> I know wonderful people who love Jesus, who are Catholic. I am not picking on the Catholic Church because it is just as much a mistake to think that there is somehow a spiritual uh, benefit to be gained by having a great big fat family Bible sitting on your coffee table if you live in the South and never opening it. And so that magically is going to help you. I'm going to talk about magic in a minute. But it's not just the Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church. That. We have a tendency to those things too. I know Protestants that, you know, my mother would, she was not, at this time she was not a Christian, I believe she became to the faith later. If somebody, if there was a Bible laid on the coffee table, which is where she kept it sitting, if somebody laid another book on it, she'd go, oh, no, no, you can't do that. <laughs> okay? No. I mean, that's not, we don't go there. I'm getting into the, the sort of magical thing first. Um, I've talked a little bit already about where the spiritual disciplines come from. Let me get to that. The spiritual disciplines are... <laughs> really, really ancient in their roots. Ancient meaning there were some spiritual disciplines that the, the Jewish faith had. Jesus uh, practiced almost all of the classic disciplines of the Christian faith. Uh, solitude, silence, simplicity, study, prayer, service, fasting, etc. The disciples did. The early centuries of the church particularly began to concentrate on these being a way in which we could be sanctified, become more holy. But Besides Jesus, in Scripture, we have Paul uh, advocating meditation and stewardship. You know, Paul was a great fundraiser, and it was, an act of, it was an act of commitment 
and sanctification before the Lord to give to, to the needs of the church. The book of James, as we'll see if you come to our Friday morning Bible study, encourages us to confess our sins to one another. Um, all of these things in Scripture, either directly or indirectly, we have a basis for the spiritual disciplines there. If we don't have a basis for those things, then I have a question as to whether we should consider spiritual disciplines, even if we may feel spiritual benefit. Because you've got to draw a line somewhere or it gets a little silly. Okay. Um, <coughs> now, now I get to this verse. Um, in terms of the spiritual disciplines being biblical, Paul in 1 Timothy writes this, Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tale. Rather, and here's the point, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. Now the Greek word that Paul uses here in this passage, which we translate train, as you'll see, train yourself to be godly, the word literally means exercise or discipline. In fact, the Greek word is gymnazo, which is where we get the word gymnasium. It means to train yourself like an athlete. Um, and uh, the New International or the New American Standard Bible translates it: discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. It literally means in the direction of godliness. If there's a sense in which you progress as you discipline yourself, as you train yourself. As you exercise these things, you will move toward greater godliness. And again, people who think that, okay, I love Jesus, so I'm just going to sit back in my recliner and I'm going to get holier every day. <laughs> There's a reason why Paul says that is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, that we might become more holy. Paul uses this sort of uh, athletic example in other places where he says that I run the race set before me. The idea that you've got to get out there and, and train yourself, be disciplined about these things, if you are going to grow in your holiness and if you are going to satisfy the expectations God has for you as his child and his minister. Because this isn't just about us. It's about how we represent the truth of Jesus Christ to the rest of the world. Another verse, again from, uh, from Paul, Romans 12, 1 to 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Do not be conformed to this world. <clears throat> Remember what we said earlier? Evelyn Underhill's comment about, you know, we spend our whole lives conjugating the three verbs. No. <coughs> I want, I to, to have, want to have to do. The world doesn't get this. And yet we are not supposed to be conformed to the way of the world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And I think one of the renewal, you know, what we're talking about here, the spiritual disciplines, the spiritual exercises are a way to renewal. Yes? Um, I just want to comment on what you said about, you know, about holiness and things. I think it can be compared to, like, uh, what Jesus showed a difference in um, holiness of how Pharisees thought what looked holy mm -hmm. and how Jesus lived holiness. Right. And, and it was totally different. And he he would walk among those that were the sick and the lepers. And, and he was hope for people, whereas the Pharisees kind of steered away from that. Right. And so what Jesus or what God um, sees as holiness is a lot of times different from what we've been raised in church to see of what's holiness, which a lot of times was criticism. Um, you know, who is sometimes good enough to fit in our group, or, you know, some of those kind of things that kind of get dragged in there that shouldn't be dragged in there. Mm -hmm. 
don't know. Am I making sense? Well, yeah. Um, but I think there's a there's a, a living out. You know, if we become more holy, then it begins to be lived out in us, and we'll we'll get into that probably in the conclusion time of the class. <coughs> We're studying the book of James in our Bible study, and we're very shortly going to get to the passage that James says, and religion that the Lord finds acceptable is this, that you care for widows and orphans and do not allow yourself to be polluted by the world. Now, some people have wrongly, some people down through history have wrongly thought, don't be polluted by the world, we better lock ourselves behind gates and not let anybody in. That's not what he meant, because if you do that, how are you going to care for the widows and orphans? Jesus said, be light and salt to the world. And you've heard me say before, those of you who've heard me talk, you can't be light and salt to the world if you never get close enough to the world to let them see you and taste you. But the point is of not being polluted by the world, it means don't fall for all the stuff they tell you is important. <coughs> Instead, be holy, even as your Father in Heaven is. Okay, And so, don't be sucked into what the world's trying to tell you. Be different than that. Be holy. Come, be, be like Jesus by practicing the kind of spirituality that Jesus uh, demonstrated for us. And that will result in things like caring for widows and orphans. And it will, it will result in compassion of the kind that Jesus showed. Because once we have learned to be more like him in our spirituality, we will become more like him in our compassion. And in a lot of other ways too. Okay? All right, let's talk for a minute, and uh, this is the, the, the last couple of things I want to talk about today. Um, is, uh, okay, I'll get to that. Why some Christians have such a hard time understanding or accepting this idea of the spiritual disciplines? I'll give you several reasons, I think. Um, the first reason, a lot of evangelicals, that is, people who believe in the truth of the scripture is God's word, of the divinity of Jesus, etc. There's actually a historical definition I'd give you sometimes about what it means to be an evangelical as opposed to a fundamentalist. But basically it means we believe in the, in the miraculous presence of uh, God in Jesus Christ and in his word. So we evangelicals, we have a natural tendency to want to avoid anything that smacks of, uh, of works, of meritorious works, that we are doing anything just to get grace for ourselves. All right? Paul in Ephesians said, By grace you were saved through faith. It is the free gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So there's a fear on the part of many people that if you are, you know, if you're studying word, if you're praying, if you're fasting, if you're <laughs> solitude and silence or whatever, that you're doing it in order to try to earn credit with God. That you think that by doing those as works of righteousness, that you in some way will be better in God's sight. Well, that's not true. People who say that reduce faith to an... They're the people who reduce faith to an entirely mental affair without realizing that it does need to have some kind of effect experientially, both in our heart and in our lives. How we live our lives. We're going to get into that in the book of James, by the way. Keep referring to that. If you don't come to our Bible study, it's 10 o'clock on Friday mornings, right? This room right here. Um, the, the people who complain about this as being the spiritual disciplines as though they were works oriented, they overshoot the mark. The principle is true. We are not saved by works. The Protestant Reformation, you know, the, the, the great cries of the Protestant Reformation were sola scriptura, scripture alone, sola gratia, grace alone, sola fide. Faith alone. It's not works. It's not because you, you, you score enough points and God's going to love you then. No, God loves you anyway. But just because we don't believe in works righteousness does not mean that everything is only propositional truth, statements, words that we believe, without any experiential practice. To start with our understanding of the propositional truth of Jesus as Lord, but at some point that needs to soak down into the rest of us into our heart, into our lives, into our experience of our relationship with God. This is one way in which Protestant spirituality differs with the his, some of, not all, but some of the historic Catholic spirituality. Because in the Catholic disciplines, the, uh, the idea of seeking spiritual perfection, they actually talked about those things, that they, would, they were seeking perfection, they would use the word. We're not going there. We're not going to become spiritually perfect. But we can be more like Jesus. We can be closer to God. Some people, um, 
in the Protestant church, another reason that they give for why they don't like the idea of spirituality is they do associate it entirely with the Catholic church. They say, oh, that's Catholic stuff. Okay, spiritual disciplines is Catholic stuff. Well, that's why, you know, it took Richard Foster and people like him to really make Protestants wake up to this fact. He's, he's by the way, a Quaker. Um, he's a Protestant Quaker. The thing that they don't realize is that the, rich, the original development of the disciplines of the, you know, the spiritual disciplines of the faith started in the early centuries of the church when there was no Catholic versus Protestant. It was when we were all one church, and so we have as much a claim to that history. We can't say, oh, that's Catholic. There weren't Catholics back then. At least if there were, then we were too. That was before there was the division, in the same way that the creeds. Our church, we use the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed from the 2nd century and, and the 4th century. Well, those were creeds of the Catholic Church, but we were Catholics then too, so there are creeds too. I actually had a Catholic friend one time. He said, well, you know, if you don't believe that the Pope is infallible, then what do you base your faith on? I said, we base it on Scripture. And he said, well, anybody can interpret Scripture differently. And I said, it has been interpreted through the creeds. He said, which creeds? I said, Apostles' Creed and uh, Nicene Creed. He said, oh, those are our creeds. <laughs> Mine too! That was before there was a me and you, you know, and ours and theirs, when we were all one church. In the same way, the spiritual disciplines began in the early century, scripture actually, and then the early century of the church before there was a Catholic and Protestant. So we have a claim to them too. Nobody can just say, oh, those are Catholic things. Now, we do need, as I say, to recognize that there are some Catholic disciplines that are not universally practiced in the Catholic Church, but are practiced in some parts of the Catholic Church that we don't accept. Um, the idea of celibate monasticism is not something that's part of the Protestant Church, with very rare exceptions. Or uh, the use of rosary beads or mortification of the flesh, and most Catholics don't do that, don't buy into that, but some do. We don't accept those things. And so there are some differences between Catholic and Protestant spiritual disciplines these days, okay? but not it's not like, oh, no, all those disciplines are Catholic things. They're not. They're for us, too. It's also true that some Christians associate the spiritual disciplines with Eastern or mystic religions. They look at things like yoga or vegetarianism. Oh, vegetarianism. Um, <laughs> or chanting of various kinds and say that's all Eastern and mystic, etc. And again, some, you know, some Catholic and probably even some Protestants have gone more toward the mysticism side completely away from any propositional truth, uh, and say, well, it doesn't matter if you have it, you know, to what words you use or what you think about it, it's entirely experience. No, it's not. The reason we were given the truth of Jesus Christ in words is because words matter, and what they say matters, and we need to understand them, and we need to profess them, but we also need to experience them in more than just words and more than just our brain. Okay? So those are some of the reasons I think, and they're really misunderstandings. Misunderstandings by some Protestants today who say, well, it's works righteousness. No, it's not. I mean, you, it can be. You can let it go there, but that's not what we're talking about. Uh, who say it's all Catholic. No, this started before there was Catholic and Protestant. Who say it's all Eastern and mystic. doesn't have to be. Um, this can be a very solid, grounded kind of thing based upon, as I said before, the profession of Jesus Christ is Lord. So, and... So for us, besides some of the problems people have, or some of the difficulties people have with it, what are, what are some potential problems as we get into this? Well, the word spiritual and spirituality, and this is the first problem we need to admit to, they become notoriously fuzzy concepts nowadays. They do, to a lot of people, they sort of ring of new age kind of stuff, because that's how they've been used a lot. Now, spiritual and spirituality has kind of positive overtones, but most people have never really thought about what they mean. So many people today think of themselves as being spiritual, and what they mean by that is they have certain aesthetic sensibilities, or they feel kind of a mystical connection with nature, or they espouse some highly privatized version of any number of religions. And we've, some of you I've talked to before about the number of people today who will say, well, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. You heard that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Spiritual has a positive connotation for most people, even if they don't know what it means, which most people don't. Religious has a negative connotation for most people. It shouldn't, but it does. Because, let's face it, a lot of religions, the Jews in the first, uh, first century in the New Testament, and a lot of the Protestants and Catholics today, 
You know, they've, they've bound people up with burdens of guilt and all kinds of stuff, which is not biblical, I don't think. But the fact is, I believe if somebody says that I'm spiritual but not religious, what they really mean, whether they know it or not, what they really mean is I want to get all the benefits of spirituality and faith, but I don't want any of the responsibilities. Because religious means that you are practicing a life of commitment to living out your beliefs. A person who says they're spiritual but not religious means I want all the benefits, none of the responsibilities. Well, we're here to talk about how we need to accept some of the responsibilities, like being disciplined to pray, to study God's Word, to meditate on it, to grow closer to God by becoming more like Jesus Christ. That's religious, and that's good. But there is a lot of confusion about what spiritual means and what religious means in the world today. In fact, um, when we talk about spiritual, let me give you a definition. The, in the New Testament, in Paul, in 1 Corinthians, Paul says that only a Christian can be spiritual. Did you know that? Everything else is false. 1 Corinthians 2, 13 and 14. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. And here it is. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. From our perspective as Christians, believers in God's Word, Paul tells us to be spiritual only means to have the Holy Spirit in you. Everything else is a falsehood. Everything else, the great deceiver has convinced people wrongly that they are being spiritual when in fact they are not. They have bought into some false doctrine or beliefs. I take no pleasure in saying that, and I'd like for everybody to be right. But instead of being, I'm not being judgmental, what I'm saying is, we have work to do. Because it is our job to help people understand what it truly means to be spiritual, which means to accept by the Holy Spirit the truth of the Spirit, the first truth of which is Jesus is Lord. It's our job to help solve that problem. And one of the ways we can do it is by growing in our own experience of God through the, through the, the disciplines. Now, um, again, one of the differences, and I started to address this a second ago, uh, one of the things that Roman Catholic spirituality has done, which I think, I think was an error, and sometimes is still an error, is that they tend to say that spiritual, spirituality, the spiritual disciplines, or the exercises, if you will, um, are intended for the most mature, really the elite, particularly those who are in monastic orders. Um, the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, for instance, was for a monastic order. I think anybody could benefit from that sort of thing. That it is not that a spiritual uh, disciplines kind of approach to life is just for these high-level elite troop kind of thing in, in the body, but rather I believe they're for everybody. We are not seeking to attain perfection, perfection, which is part of the Catholic uh, spirituality idea, but rather we are wishing to be more like Jesus, more like Jesus. Okay. Um, I think I almost need to close up here. The last thing I would say in terms of a danger, well, the last two things I would say in terms of danger is that for some people, they come to think that the point is just doing the discipline. Okay, If I... Spend an hour in prayer. If I spend two hours in studying the Bible, then I'm done. That's it. That the doing of the act is the point. It is not. You can be spiritually disciplined until the cows come home, and if your focus is not on becoming, as, as Whitney says, pursuing holiness, being closer to God, being more like Jesus, then you're going to miss it. In fact, practicing the disciplines for their own sake only leads to one thing, and that is pride which is the first of all sins. You end up with people saying, whether they say it out loud or not, and some people are silly enough that they actually do say it out loud, well, I'm holier than that person because I study my Bible twice as long every day than they do. <laughs> I've had people say to me, you know, I or my spouse has read through the Bible 17 times. <laughs> 
And my response is, did it sink in? Because <laughs> I don't think it did in some cases. All right. The point is that it's not just the doing of the thing, because that only leads to pride. It is the seeking after God to be more like Jesus in relationship with God through these practices. And if, if that's your focus, God will bless that. Okay? But that's a mistake that people make, is they think doing it is the point, not becoming more godly is the point. And Richard Foster said, to know the mechanics, that is just the how to do it, does not mean that we are practicing the disciplines. The spiritual disciplines are an inward and spiritual reality, and the inner attitude of the heart is far more crucial than the mechanics for coming into the reality of spiritual life. Okay? It's not just the mechanics of doing this stuff when we talk about prayer or fasting or anything else. The last point I want to make for the day is another danger that people run into is that the spiritual disciplines and the objects which they may use as devotional aids to help them with the spiritual disciplines can provide, unfortunately, a location for the growth of superstition and a belief in magic. Um, there are legitimate purposes for devotional aids. If an icon or image sincerely directs our thoughts and hearts toward God, then there's nothing wrong with it. If the use of beads to help discipline you and focus your prayer, sincere, heartfelt prayer, not just muttering of words in order, then there's nothing wrong with it. Symbols. We have a cross hanging over our altar table in here. There's nothing wrong with that as long as we don't start thinking that that somehow is magical and it protects this place. However, human nature being what it is, there is a very strong pull toward us to begin to take those kinds of things, um, icons, pious symbols, etc., and start thinking that they have a spiritual significance in their own right, that they somehow have power to bless or curse. And again, I, I'm not picking on the Catholic Church, but we happen to be in the most Catholic country in the world, and so there are a lot of examples of this that come along. I talked before about the fact that I was so really disheartened, is probably the best description. You know of Our Lady uh, of Zapopan. Okay, it's the statue, it's over 400 years old. And they every year they have a, a they bring it down here, a pilgrimage, they bring it down to the lake and then they take it back. Well, because the original one is over 400 years old, they got special permission from the Vatican to have a new one made. And I was reading the article about this in the Guadalajara Reporter, and they said, but, you know, Catholic, you know, the Catholic faithful do not need to worry because they made sure they took the old version of Zapopan and had it touch the new one so that it would convey some of the power into this new statue. <coughs> That's magic. That's superstition. Yes. There is no, and, and again, I'm not picking on Catholics. They, they, again, my, my family, family members, not just my mother, but others, they thought having this giant family Bible sitting on their coffee table in some way was a magical, it was a talisman. There was something magical about it. Protestants do this too, especially the Southern the Protestants. Bumper. What's that? The fish on the bumper. The fish on the bumper. Okay. <laughs> now again, it could be that these things are testimonies that, you know, of what I believe, but if you really think there's some power in that to either bless or curse, you know, if you if you lay a book on that Bible, oh, you know, God's not going to like that. No. So, unfortunately, while there may be a legitimate place for some um, articles that help us in our act of legitimate devotion, too often our human tendency is for those to become things that we invest with some wrong idea of power. The spiritual disciplines, some of them have things that like prayer, the idea of using uh, a rosary or prayer beads or whatever to direct, to help direct you through the prayer. If you've got the right heart and you use it the right way, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But the human nature is such that it's very dangerous because you can go the wrong way. Yes, Dan? I was just going to say half of the emails. I got one this morning saying, here's a prayer. It was a nice prayer. And pass it on to seven people. Or yeah, exactly. I mean, these are like chain, uh, emails of the modern chain letters. They say, send this on to everyone in your prayer list. If you do, you'll be blessed. And if you don't, then you, you know, bad things will happen to you. I beg your pardon. I serve a God that is not afraid of you. Okay. 
Mark. Well, we do have the precedence in Scripture where the sick press through the crowds and they touch the hand of Jesus' garment and be healed. And so maybe somehow they make a connection there. Well, and I think that that's true. I think there are uh, the, the woman who has suffered from an issue of blood, who, without Jesus even being aware she was doing it, touched the hem of his garment and she was healed. But the point there is that her faith was in Jesus and that even touching the garment of Jesus would heal her. We also have that Apostle Paul, it says that you know he had a kerchief that he had used and that it healed people when they touched it. I mean, there are reasons why some of these doctrines have developed. But again, I think Paul was always so insistent, I mean, absolutely adamant, it's not me, it's the one I serve. And so if people were healed by touching, you know, by his, Paul or Peter's shadow falling on them, or they were healed by touching something of theirs, it wasn't because they believed it was a magic talisman, talisman or they would not have been healed. They were healed because they said, the God that Paul worships, as I touch this, I'm, I'm putting words to this, but I think this must be the theological truth, that as I touch this, I ask that the God that Paul serves be heal me. Okay? That kind of thing rather than it being that that became a magical cloth. And even the centurion who said, you, you, I'm not worthy to have you in my house, but just... Exactly. You don't have to, you know, I'm a man who commands many people, you know, and uh, don't come to my house. I'm not worthy. And Jesus said that not in all of Israel have I seen such faith as this. For that, your servant is healed. Uh, there wasn't anything magical about it. God can heal from a distance. He doesn't need to have... The old statue touched the new statue, so it'll be magically in, uh, in, you know, uh, empowered. empowered with something. All right. Any last questions before we uh, close in prayer? I shouldn't have told you I was almost finished because people start loading up. <laughs> okay. Thank you for being here. Next week we will start out talking about Bible study and meditation. Let me close in prayer.